The original paraphernalia for the flash fiction contest had been lost long ago, and the black box now rested on the stool had been put into use even before old man Stewart, the oldest man in town, was born. Mr. Lieberman spoke frequently to the forum members about making a new box, but no one liked to upset even as much tradition as was represented by the black box. There was a story that the present box had been made with some pieces of the box that had preceded it, the one that had been constructed when the first people settled down to make a village here. Mr. Garrett and his oldest daughter, Victoria, hold the black box securely on the stool until Mr. Lieberman can stir the papers thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had been forgotten or discarded, Mr. Lieberman had been successful in having slips of paper substituted for the chips of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr. Lieberman had argued, had been all very well when the village was tiny, but now that the population was more than 300 and likely to keep on growing, it was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. Pseudopod proudly presents the start of the fifth incarnation of the Escape Artist Flash Fiction Contest. Winners of the contest will be determined by the members of the forums. The winning stories will be published in an episode in the author's paid pro rates. Head over to the forums, take up your stone, and perform your civic duty by joining in the harvest festivals of the October country. Welcome to Pseudopod Towers. Get comfy. Find a cushion to hide behind. You're going to need it. Pseudopod, episode 562 for September 29th, 2017. A Howling Dog by Nick Mamatas. I'm Alex, co-editor of Pseudopod, your host this week. Nick Mamatas is the author of several novels, including The Last Weekend and I Am Providence. His short fiction has appeared previously here at Pseudopod three times, as well as in Best American Mystery Stories, Asimov Science Fiction, and many other venues. His next book is an anthology of flash fiction and cocktail recipes called Mixed Up, co-edited with Molly Tanzer. Links to the books and its social media will be in the show notes. A Howling Dog is a Pseudopod original. For our narrators, we stalk the halls of Pseudopod Towers. For the full cast list, check the show notes. Now, turn off your Facebook notifications and log off that chat board. Because we have a story for you. And we promise, it's true. A throat. A Howling Dog by Nick Mamatas The app, an associated website, had another name, but it was most appropriate to think of it as Crankily. It was for neighbors to anonymously discuss neighborly things, but social media was as prone to Gresham's law as anything else. The bad conversations drove out the good ones. It only took three months or so from initial launch for the posts to be all about suspicious dark-skinned men skulking around town, supposedly delivering the so-called mail, the essential wrongness of mowing the lawn in one's boxer shorts, and conspiracy theorizing about the next major ISIS attack hitting town, because a super Walmart, one of the really nice ones, is just five miles down on Route 5, is a juicy target for jihadis. A juicy target, indeed. The post that started all the real problems in Crankalee's Almeida County Zone 4 was this one, posted one afternoon just a week ago. Hey neighbors, I've been hearing a dog howl slash cry at all hours from my apartment close to the corner of Russell and Schiffer. I was wondering, does anyone know who the dog belonged to? 
It breaks my heart, and I'm wondering if the owner knows about it. One of the dogs I fostered a few years back had severe separation anxiety and would howl for most of the time when I left for work and I didn't know about it until a neighbour alerted me, at which point I was able to work on the separation anxiety with her. Any leads appreciated. Thanks. On the surface, a perfectly ordinary post. An especially pleasant one for Crankily. Actually, despite the specter of an ever-howling dog. The post garnered no comments, though for the reason you have surely already guessed. Nobody else had heard the dog. Certainly not at all hours. The best thing to do in such a case is just not respond at all. There are plenty of other threads to read. Why explain? Why ask? Why encourage further discussion? Three days later, the poster issued a follow-up. Russell and Schiffer Residence. Hello again. I am still hearing a dog howl and whine day and night. Every day and every night. It is definitely coming from 2774 Schiffer. Please take care of your dog. If you live in 2774 Schiffer, you have a responsibility to call your landlord or management company or talk to your neighbour about how he or she but let's be honest, probably a he, cares for a companion animal. I am beginning to wonder if the issue is actual abuse rather than just neglect and separation anxiety. I do not want to have to call the city, as too often neglected animals are brought to shelters where they are quickly euthanized. And then the howling will never stop. A much more off-putting message. Why would anyone respond to that? There was no dog at all. The poster was obviously dealing with some sort of mental issue, or was trolling. Either way, nobody living in 2774 Schiffer, a squat six-unit apartment building of one-bedroom apartments, would have any call to extend the thread. And yet, someone did. Actually, by definition, the howling would stop then, eh? The strict discipline showed by the crankily regulars fractured then. Tasteless! Was upvoted two dozen times, while... Really funny, buddy. A total howler was buried under a mountain of downvotes. One individual even tried to talk sense to the OP. I live on the corner of Russell and Schiffer, catty corner from 2774. Full-time freelancer, work from home. I don't wear earbuds or even watch TV, and I like to keep my windows open when I can, because I love the fragrance of lilacs. I have several large bushes in my yard. N never heard a dog howl even once, much less at all hours. Several other people acknowledged the truth. Nobody had ever heard a dog anywhere in the vicinity, much less howling emanating from 2774 Schiffer, which was a residence with a draconian policy when it came to regulations and pet deposits for even mere cats. Dogs were absolutely forbidden. The howling isn't just non-existent, it's impossible. Which was, of course, false. It's not impossible for there to have been a dog in a building in which dogs are banned. And just because only one person could hear its howling doesn't mean that the howling was a delusion. There could have been a conspiracy of silence around the dog, around its constant cries for attention and relief. Indeed, all the comments responding to the original post could have been from one busy person, creating a narrative of tasteless rejoinders and cynicism from whole cloth, just to further demoralize and upset the original poster. For that matter, the initial post regarding the curious incident of a bark without a dog could have been an attempt at internet virality. Creepypasta, as the kids say. Crankley's moderation policies leave something to be desired. Anyone with an email address can post what they please so long as they eschew certain slurs. The only reason there's little spam or true hate-mongering on the site is that its user base of middle-class busybodies and PTA lifetime members is of little interest to the broader online world. But what's next? A report of a dog corpse surfacing in the soft dirt in the yard in front of the building after a week of heavy rains? Or worse, bones found in the walls after 2774 Schiffer condo conversion? Condo conversions being one of the perennial flamebait topics on Crankily. Or is it no dog at all? but instead some woman or child gone feral and chained to a pipe near a rusty bucket of excrement that had been howling all these days. That full-time freelance writer was especially suspicious, someone with an inclination toward fiction, 
and likely the impulse to procrastinate by goofing around on the internet all day. Was all of Crankily going to be written up in some obnoxious essay about group psychology or urban legends? There was only one thing to do. Specifically, it was time to type, I hear it too, and then press publish. Another ten hours of silence on the thread, as if the neighborhood was holding its collective breath. And then a new party, or a new claim anyway, entered the thread. I'm new to this website, but I heard from a friend about it and came to check what people in the Wyndham neighborhood are discussing. I thought this conversation was pretty interesting. I used to live in the building years ago, and there was often a dog tied outside at all times and all weather. It's mostly warm and sunny here in Northern California, but you know what I mean. She wouldn't actually howl or bark all that much, but I felt very sad whenever I saw the dog. One time I stood in the yard and I started howling, like that dog should have. I guess it was just trying to get some attention for the poor animal. Not one person even opened their blinds to look out the window and see what the ruckus was. It was a Sunday morning, too, so people were home. I could see movement through the blinds and the windows. I really howled my head off. Anyway, this is all more than 20 years ago, so that dog is probably long dead. But I just wanted to share the story as a way of reminding you all to be good to one another. Have a blessed day. And then it was a war of all against all. Accusations flew, sock puppets, tricks, spam, Russian hackers hoaxing and punking, and repeated uploads of that now ancient New Yorker cartoon panel featuring the adage, On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Someone kept trying. But I really do hear it too. Doesn't anyone else hear it? I'm not the OP. After some time, this poster went on. This is insane. You're all online, all day long, and live within a mile of the place. Just walk outside. I live across the street. I can hear it now. Meet me on the corner of Russell and Schiffer. I'll be wearing a blue hat. I have a long beard and glasses. I'll be the one with the iPhone in hand, listening to and recording the howling of the dog. I'm not the OP. This is not a joke. It's noon now. I'll step outside in ten minutes and stand on the corner until 12.30. You can walk a mile in less than 20 minutes if you're reasonably healthy. Just come out and listen. Perhaps some of the lurkers on the thread contemplated joining the man, but no active posters did. Then the responses came. Let me guess. I walk all the way to Schiffer Street and you're there with a gun to steal my iPhone. Oh, don't be paranoid. It's probably some dumb prank. They'll have a dog ready to howl or even just a recording of one, and they'll video the reactions of whoever is there for some sort of tedious found footage movie. I am the dog. Come visit me. Oh. Mio reads to me much more like a cat than a dog, so clearly you are dumb enough to be a dog. Do us all a favor and stop howling all day or start so we know what's what. And the subthread was finished. Despite the claims explicit and implicit in the homepage copy and related images, Crankley was not successfully bringing communities together, nor was there very much openness and honesty created by the anonymity of the service. Not even when one Jack Reinhard, a longtime neighborhood resident, was hit by a car while standing right on Schiffer Street. A vehicle had jumped the curb and sped off. Nobody emerged from their homes to render aid. Nobody called 911. Reinhardt had to do it himself with his own broken arm. His blue hat fluttered away and landed on a Y-shaped tree branch half a block away. Someone took a photo of that and posted it on Crankily. Reinhardt had no local visitors during his overnight hospital stay and only contacted his sister, who lived hours away in Sacramento. It took a day and a night for the hat to fall from the branch, and that was thanks to a squirrel not part of our program. Setting a grease fire in one of the first-floor apartments of 2774 Schiffer was no help either. Sure, crankily posters made comments, Ooh, sirens, 
was upvoted a dozen times, and in the morning the URL to the local newspaper's story on the topic was also posted. But while the fire burned and emergency vehicles congregated, not one window opened. Not one local crankily poster toddled outside to see what was going on. Certainly nobody even recalled the threat about the ever-howling dog supposedly in residence so many had engaged with just five days prior. A prod. Did the firefighters find the dog? The responses were not encouraging. That would have been a grilled hot dog, eh? Another poster, perhaps attempting to lighten the mood, posted a photo of a dachshund puppy in a hot dog bun. Couldn't hear the howling over the siren, sorry, and also because I'm not off my medication and can't hear imaginary dogs. Incorrigible, a lot of them, it seemed. Crankley may have well benefited from rules against anonymity, or at least from a mechanism that would compel posters to hold to a consistent identity, like most bulletin boards and internet comment sections. The online world is full of trolls and griefers, but surely people would be nice to their neighbors whom they already knew, or could potentially face in heated meat space conversations after mouthing off online, no? Well, perhaps, after all, the answer is still, at least potentially, yes. Finally, someone put up a post worth reading, a simple message of compassion and kindness. I think we may all be having a hard time lately. I know things have been rough for me. I'm not calling anyone out. I'm just saying how I've personally been feeling these past few days. I'm sorry if anything I've posted has annoyed or agitated anyone. I wish you all health and peace. I really mean it. I usually have a drink at Raleigh's every night, same stool right in front of the cash register, same time, 7.30 p.m. If anyone wants to come out and sidle up next to me, I'll buy you a cocktail. All are welcome. Eureka! Anonymity under pressure can lead to improvements in sociability and fellow feeling among neighborhood residents. This calls for a refinement of our protocol. The next step is clear. To procure and torture a real dog, day and night. Or perhaps a child. Consider this a lesson of Plato on the Ring of Gyges. According to the tradition, Gyges possessed a ring that made him invisible. Upon receiving this, he contrived to be chosen as one of the messengers who were sent to the court, where as soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen, and with her help, conspired against the king and slew him, and took the kingdom. Suppose now there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one, and the unjust the other. No man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off of what was not his own when he could safely take what he liked out of the market, or go into houses and lie with anyone at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like a god among men. For all men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice. If you could imagine anyone obtaining this power of becoming invisible and never doing any wrong or touching what was in others, he would be thought by the onlookers to be a most wretched idiot. Although they would praise him to one another's faces and keep up appearances with one another from a fear that they might too suffer injustice. Or maybe a lack of likes. Or a whole bunch of downvotes. On a brighter note, a bit of news that should be of interest to our listeners. Last week, stores were assailed by Paperbacks from Hell by Grady Hendrix. You may remember him from our Tales from the White Street Society stories. If you don't, get thee to the back catalog. In this new nonfiction book, Grady guides you through the boom and bust of the horror paperback scene in the 70s and 80s. 
My horror book club is diving into this for October, as the volume of that era's fiction fire hose is truly intimidating. This book could be considered Grady Reads Bad Books So You Don't Have To, but it's so much more. It unearths forgotten gems and highlights the work of a number of cover artists that did the heavy lifting of sales. If you do nothing but buy this book to appreciate all the glossy reproductions of those horror covers, you've got your money's worth. You also have to appreciate Quirk Books' continued dedication to making the physical book worth holding. Horror Store looks and feels like an Ikea catalog. My Best Friend's Exorcism feels either like a yearbook or looks like it belongs on the shelf at a blockbuster video. With paperbacks from hell, they resurrected the raised and embossed lettering that was so famous during the boom. I rate this book absolutely worth your time. And if you don't go out and buy a copy, go to your local library and ask for it. If they don't have it, put in a request. Libraries listen to that stuff. They want to have books that people want to read. And it's a real easy way to show an author that you love them by making sure that they go on the request list. This podcast is possible only through the donations of a tiny percentage of you. If you enjoyed this story, act as though you were being observed by the crowd and head over to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod to subscribe at a level that assuages your guilt. Pseudopod is a part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The music is by permission of Anders Manga. Pseudopod knows that on the internet, no one knows you're a monster. 